child once found a bird's nest in which were eggs, and the child viewed those delicately marked eggs as being a real treasure. And the child would come back over the course of weeks and check on these little eggs, and after some absence from checking the nest, she came and saw that the only thing left in the nest were broken uh, eggshells. And the child looked on these broken eggshells and then went running to the mother saying, I had these beautiful eggs in the nest and now they are destroyed. There's nothing left but a few broken pieces. Feel sorry for me, mother. My treasure is gone. But the mother responded saying, child, this is not a sad thing. This is not some major destruction. There were little birds inside of those eggs, and those birds have now hatched, and while you've been gone away, they've developed, and now they are gone from the nest, and they are uh, singing uh, in the various branches of the trees. The eggs were not wasted, but they have served their purpose. It is far better as it is. And so it is when we look on our departed loved ones. We can be inclined to say, oh, death, is this all that you left us? You left us this bit of bones and flesh and it's subject to decay? But faith whispers within us no, the shell is broken, but among the birds of paradise is where you will find the spirits of your loved ones singing to the glory of God. Their true manhood is not here in the empty shell, but it has ascended to God, our Heavenly Father. It is not a loss for the Christian to die, but it is a great gain for the believer to advance to that state where he or she is no longer sinful, but is actually sinless. So in light of our sister's passing and the funeral that we've had on Friday, uh, I want us to consider what happens to the believer at the moment that he or she dies. Now, as I begin, I want to give three basically biblically-based assumptions. I'm not going to take the time to prove them. I could, but simply to state them so that you know and I know what our foundation is. As created by God, assumption one. As created by God, we are composed of two parts, which are body and soul. Second assumption, at death, there is a radical separation as the soul is pulled away from the body. Assumption number three, Jesus Christ's glorious return will be the occasion of the raising and glorifying of the bodies of believers. So this evening, I present to you a modified form of a study that we have looked at at least a few times over the years, what happens to the believer when passing from this life to the next. And I do so without shame. One of you has said that is a study, that's a sermon that we need to hear once a year. I view it more like a catechism question. We don't read a catechism question in the proof text that are given there and say, okay, that's the only time I need to look at that in my life. 
but we view the, a catechism question as something that is central enough. We need to read it. We need to hear the answers and seek to uh, bring it into us. We need to remind ourselves of central biblical truths. So what happens when the believer dies? Roman number one. Four wonderful realities in the immediate sequel to death. Sequel. It means the follow-up, the continuation. It's part two or part three to the story. Immediate sequel. While the body is still warm, but the soul has been taken from that body, what has happened to the soul? So when we are considering this particular time, we're looking at what is called the intermediate state. It's a time when we're alive here on earth. We have our bodies and our souls, and there will be a time off in heaven where we have our bodies and souls, both glorified, joined back together. But we're talking about a period in between where it is the soul that is in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, what happens to that believer when he or she passes from this world? First of all, A, this believer immediately is made perfect in moral likeness to Jesus Christ. Our sister, Terry, with the tremendous confidence that we may have that she was right with God because of her faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, she was immediately made perfect in moral likeness to Christ. I remind you of Romans 8, verse 29 and following, where Paul tells us, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, saying that way back before time was, before the foundation of the world, God predestined his children to what? He predestined them to be ultimately conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. That does not have happen in a way that we are made sinless in this world. It only happens when we pass on to the heavenly realm. So it is a good thing. It is a step up. And what is it to be glorified? J.I. Packer. It will be sinless souls inhabiting deathless bodies. It will be sinless souls inhabiting deathless bodies. And that ought to be appealing to us. It ought to help us to say, really, uh, my daughter, uh, this, this eggshell here, this is actually a good thing because of the advancement that has come uh, to this one who formerly occupied that shell of a body. And it's very likely, certainly very likely, that the bulk of us living in the majority of time between the first and second coming of Christ are going to receive our glorification in two stages. One, at the moment of death, our soul goes into the presence of Jesus Christ, and before it is welcomed into heaven, there is this sinlessness that is given to it. There is this glorification of the soul at death. And then it is only at the glorious return of Christ that the body is raised from the dead and glorified at that glorious return of Jesus. Now, Enoch, Moses, and Elijah, these who have gone to heaven, uh, perhaps even in their bodies, at least Enoch and Elijah, as they've gone to heaven with the body, they received the glorification of their spirit and their body at the same time. Those who are alive, when Jesus comes again, 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 15 and following, will receive their glorification in the same moment, in the same instant. But for the bulk of history, 
When believers die, they will receive their glorification in two stages, soul first, and then the body at the return of Christ. Well, what is going to happen when you die as a believer? Listen to me from Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 22. But you have come to Mount Zion, and he's given a contrast in the old covenant, they came to Mount Sinai. Now we're coming to a different mount. We're coming to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect. They were justified here on earth because of their faith. But now if you come into the company of those who have departed this world as justified believers, their record is not only made perfect, but now the whole spirit is made perfect. Here is a concentration of God's grace, Pastor Albert Martin, God's grace and power that accomplishes more in a millisecond than what we have known in a whole lifetime of seeking to be conformed to the image of Jesus. So if you are a believer in Christ, then sometime and someplace, God the Spirit has come and given you the new birth. And as he has given you the new birth, he has made you a new creation in Christ Jesus and radical changes have come to your moral life. However, a lifetime of sanctification here could be put in a little thimble and compared to the ocean of sanctification that is given at the moment the individual dies and is glorified in the Spirit. These glorified spirits are absolutely and unreservedly conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. There is no blemish in them, and there will never be another blemish that rises out of them. And that ought to be very, very appealing to us. When our believing loved one has breathed her last, her soul was released, and before she arrived at that place of heaven where Jesus is, she became fully at home, psychologically and morally and spiritually in the presence of God with not a twinge of discomfort. But that pleasant smile on her face is there without a sense of dread that would necessarily accompany me being aware of my blemishes and my moral faults. It helps us to consider that what our sister Terry has gained is much more than what we have lost. In death, you lost a believing friend, a sister in Christ, a wife, a mother. On the other hand, in death, she gained moral perfection. Surely none of us would want to slip that away from her at this point. Terry, the believer in Christ, immediately is made perfect. Secondly, B. The one who dies in Christ is immediately brought into the presence of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 6 through 8. So we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in this body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Now, in the earlier verses, Paul has referred to this 
body, this present body of this world as something as a, as a tent, but it's a tent that's got some defects in it, got some shreds, it's shredded to some degree. And he says, you know, I, I don't want to be naked. I don't want my soul to be unclothed. I don't want the tent to be pulled away from me and me just left there as a naked soul. On the other hand, when I consider that as long as I'm in this shredded tent, I am removed from the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm willing to let go of the shredded tent for the great blessing of being in the presence of Christ. It's as, lo as though Paul is saying, I've got two options. Stay around clinging to my shredded tent or let go as God brings death and go and be in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. We find this concept in Philippians 1, again, with the apostle Paul. Philippians 1 and verse 21. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I cannot tell. For I am hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. And it's as though there was a, a tug of war going on inside of Paul. Now, ultimately, as whether or not he lives or he dies, that's really not up to you and me. That's really not up to Paul, is it? But he's imagining for the moment that it is up to him. And which would I take if it were up to me? And he piles up the modifiers to be saying, and to die is gain, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better, which is very far better. Paul's not dropping into some sort of permanent anesthetic that leads him into soul sleep from the moment of passing from this world until Christ comes back in glory. No. Could the scriptures be any plainer? To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is very far better which is a great gain. Child of God, what can you know about your immediate death? Your death in Christ is gain, and your death will bring you to be delighting in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's actually a fulfillment of that prayer of the Lord Jesus where John 17, he intercedes for his people. Father, I will, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory. And this isn't it a wonderful truth? With our sin and with our guilt, so often we feel the sense of, I need to slip to the side here because my God is absolutely holy and I'm marked by stains and blemishes of sin. But what a tremendous thing to know that Jesus wants us close and he's praying that we will be with him and behold his glory. There is a fullness of our joy that awaits being in the presence of of the Lord Jesus. When you feel the crushing loneliness, when you miss the presence of your friend, you can come and recognize that the Lord wants our departed loved one to behold his glory. Here is the answer in part to Jesus' prayer. I will that they be with me and behold my glory. The believer in death gets so much in Jesus Christ, 
But there's still more to come at the great and final day. But again, it helps us to realize what she gets. She gets a soul where all the stains are taken off, all the, all the talk of Romans 7 and remaining sin, that no longer needs to be a consideration. And she gets the immediate presence of Christ with me where I am. Terry, the believer, immediately is made perfect, is brought into the presence of Christ, and thirdly, C, immediately joins the perfect fellowship of God's family, the company of the blood-washed saints of Christ. Now, everyone who is born physically is born as an individual. Doesn't matter if mom's got two babies in her womb, she's got three, she's got seven, they each have to come one at a time. We are born individually, we die individually, God's salvation comes to us as we're born again individually. And yet, the Bible sets before us heaven. One of the pictures of heaven is the new city of God. There's a city that's this many miles this way, that same number of miles this way, and it's this large, massive cube. Now, I don't know that that's a literal picture of it, but there is this vast city. There is a new humanity. There is, even as we saw this morning, there is that large palace of God patterned in our minds or in the illustration after an oriental palace where the man keeps all of his family in the same home with him. 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 17 then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Immediately joins the perfect fellowship of God's people. Who is the we? We shall always be with the Lord. Well, believers who have died and those who have been buried on land, buried at sea, believers from all sorts of denominations who at the glorious return of Christ are brought together, believers pop out of the ground, their bodies who have died and gone to heaven, their bodies pop out of the ground, and then all believers still alive on earth are joined with them. There is a perfect togetherness. And sometimes the advice is given to you when you're looking for a church. When you have found the perfect church, don't join it. Because your joining it will ruin its perfection. And there's really something to that. But we have to change that advice when we're thinking of the heavenly church. Our experience will be one of uninterrupted joy, no outcropping of sin, no selfishness that boils out. And there are times, there are seasons when we can enjoy a kind of fellowship, a kind of uh, interaction. Maybe it's at a family conference where we actually say, ah, it was a taste of heaven. It was a little slice of heaven. And so we ought to appreciate what it is to finally arrive to be a part of a fellowship that is all together perfect. For the believer, we may have known many blessings of God in this life, but the best is yet to come. A, Terry the believer immediately is made perfect. B, is brought into the presence of Christ. C, joins the perfect fellowship of Christ. And now, fourthly, D, 
immediately experiences the promised rest of Christ. And now I read to you from Revelation 14, 12 through 16. Here is the patience, the perseverance of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Do you want me to read that verse to you again? Blessed are the dead. Let it soak in. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, in order that they may rest from their labors and their works follow. Jesus has promised in his gospel invitation, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And this is a legitimate evangelistic appeal. Jesus Christ will get you, give you rest. Rest from all your works righteousness. But this is even something that is an advance on that. When the believer is living in this world, he has to be, she has to be working at being more like Christ. He or she will want to be working to extend the kingdom of Christ in our own community and really to the ends of the earth. But what is the ex immediate experience of the believer whose soul departs from the body at death? Well, they leave the realm of work. Work in the sense of that which we need to do in this sin-cursed world, and they enter what is called their rest. One speaks of it this way. But rest too, maybe rest above all. Here, responsibilities, pain, and temptation. Here, the harassment by demonic forces, persecution by the world, disappointment by friend, friends. Here, relentless pressure causing us to live at the very edge of our resources and at the very edge of our endurance. But there, rest. The battle is over, the victory is won, the toil is past. No more the burden of the unfinished work or the frustration of our inbuilt limitations. No sin to mortify, no self to crucify, no pain to face, and no enemy to fear. But it's not just a rest from. From all the negative things in this world. It means a rest that is a sharing in the blessedness of God so that at the very depth of our being there is joy and contentment and fulfillment, a total shalom, a total peace, a sense, a sense of well-being. Every need is met, every longing is fulfilled, every goal is achieved, every sense is satisfied. We see Him, He is with us, he holds us and hugs us and whispers, this is forever. What can we know about ourselves, our lives, beyond the grave? If we have truly believed in Christ, at the moment that our spirit departs, when our flesh is still warm, What's happened? We will have been made perfect in moral likeness to Christ, brought into the immediate presence of Christ, joined the perfect fellowship of God's family, and experienced the promised rest of Jesus Christ. Roman numeral two. Having looked at those wonderful realities that happen at death, Roman numeral two, closing applications from the immediate sequel to death. First of all, A, we are victors over the last enemy. We do not want to deny that death 
is still an enemy. It is called the last enemy. Listen to this, 1 Corinthians 15, the great resurrection chapter. The great bodily resurrection chapter. 1 Corinthians 15, 26, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. We need to think, to follow up on the rough doorway, that illustration of death. Death itself is still a penalty. It still is something of destruction. It's a, a pulling of the body and the soul apart. It's unnatural. But that archway, though, it, it hurts to go through it. And, and sometimes you pass through that rough door of death quickly. Sometimes you linger in it. But the point is, it's curse on this side there's the archway, there's the door of death. It's rough going through that archway. And for some, the archway is, is rather thick. But what's on the other side? No more curse at all. Unmixed blessing on the other side. Listen to how Paul lays it out. 1 Corinthians 15 Feel free to turn there if you like. Several verses. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. So yes, I know that 1 Corinthians 15 is talking about the ultimate hope of the Christian. It's not talking about what happens at the very moment that we die, but it talks about what happens the very moment where Jesus Christ comes again. And there is this glorious change. There is a dying, decayed body that may be in the grave that comes out and it's suited now to live for eternity. But what do we observe? In our union with Christ, the sting of death has been removed. Yes, we still live as believers in a sin-cursed world. Yes, when we die, we have to go through a rough door of death. Yes, there will be barbs, there will be thistles, there will be thorns that grab us as we're going through it. Some experience more of those pains than others. But the point is, on the other side, it is all good. It is all wonderfully and amazingly good. The sting of death has been removed. We are victors over the last enemy. You remember how Paul talks about this in Romans 8? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? A couple verses later, he talks about how we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that death, nor life, nor angels, and on the list go, will be able to separate us from the love of Jesus Christ, the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. At the top of the list of those things that are not going to be victorious over us is death. The sting of death has been taken away. So for the believer, it is not that we come through the rough door of death 
And then we're going to spend 1,000 or 5,000 or 10,000 years in some sort of purgatory where we get purified and ready for the next. No. No. The believer passes through the door of death. Once the true believer is through the door of death, it is all bliss. It is all good. We shall never see death as the penalty for our sin. Jesus saw it. We won't. We are victors over the last enemy through our faith in Jesus Christ. Secondly, B. We are victors over the last enemy through Christ. Through Christ. What does Paul give us right after he says, Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? Well, it's verse 57. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. No real question about why we get a victory over death. It's because of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's 1 Corinthians 15, verse 57, 58. That's the end of the chapter. And if you look back to the beginning of the chapter, we hear that the gospel may be summarized in Christ's death for our sins according to the scriptures, his burial, and his resurrection from the dead. So there's no great mystery in trying to discern how is it that Jesus takes the sting out of death for the believer. It's through the gospel. It's through that central work of Jesus on the cross, dying for our sins, being buried, and being raised again on the third day. In Romans 6, in verse 5, for if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. If you believe in Jesus, it is as though you're believing into him on the cross. All of your sin have gone to him. All of his righteousness comes to you and me. When we believe in Jesus, there is a union with him in his death on the cross. There is a union with him in his burial. And there is a union with him in his resurrection to the newness of life. There is no real mystery on how the believer has a victory over death. Romans 6 and now verse 8. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. One more passage. I'm back to 1 Corinthians 15, the resur resurrection passage. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Jesus went in the tomb. Jesus came out of the tomb. He came out of the tomb as the first fruits. What does that mean? He's the first one raised from the dead, but there's a whole bunch of others that are following after him. 1 Corinthians 15, 21. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. And we know who those men are. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive. So interestingly, as we come to the Lord's Supper, we're told to look back at Jesus, and we're told to look ahead to Jesus. Look back. As often as we break this bread, as often as we drink of the fruit of the vine that symbolizes his blood, as often as we do this, we are to remember our Lord's death. And as often as you do this, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We look back to Christ, we look forward to Christ. There is nothing of our merits 
We're saved by grace. And at the Lord's Supper, we're told, go back to Jesus. Go back to Jesus on the cross. His death, his burial, his resurrection. But here at the table of remembrance, we also want to look forward. And we need to understand that as we pass through that rough doorway, that rough archway of death, all the blessing, everything that's on the other side, all of that is a benefit that comes to us through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We believe in his person as the Son of God born of a virgin. We believe in his work of his active obedience in his perfect life and his work of passive obedience as the substitutionary sin bearer. Now, if you sit here this evening and you're not a true believer, then you ought to be afraid of death. Because when you pass through physical death, rough door of death, you're passing through into a realm where there's nothing good. There's nothing but curse. There is no blessing. There's not even the common grace and the restraining influence of the Holy Spirit in this sin-cursed world. There's none of that on the other side for you. It's being raised body and soul. to be destroyed by God. The smoke of their torment ascends forever. But don't stay there. If you have a fear of death, come to Jesus. Because the child of God does not need to fear death. And you know, this is not even limited to the New Testament revelation. All the way back there with David. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. If you're not yet in Christ, think about this sad reality. At death, your destiny will be irreversibly fixed. Well, maybe I used too big of a word. At death, what you are at death is what you will continue in for all eternity. No second chances after death. That's the message of God. God has sent his son. God has given provision. God calls on you to come to the Lord Jesus Christ and he solemnly warns you once you pass through that door of death, that's it. As death leaves you, so the judgment finds you and as the judgment finds you, eternity will hold you. And reality is you may sit here this evening being fairly comfortable fairly comfortable outside of Jesus Christ. I grant that. But here's my question for you. If God gives you a deathbed, God gives you some warning that your death is coming. God has your death not to be a, a quick, sudden emergency car accident or a motorcycle accident or a tractor accident or a fluke thing, a married man getting up from the table starts coughing and he chokes on his own food and dies. That happens. You may be very comfortable sitting here tonight, but if God gives you a deathbed and a time to reflect on your life, will you be comfortable then? Or will a dread of death overwhelm you? 
Then there will be nowhere to hide in your every idle word, every unclean thought, every dishonest relationship, every single violation of the law of God will be brought up against you. This is the day of judgment. As you die, you go to judgment. The books will be opened and you will be judged out of the books according to what you have done. You're young, you're healthy. Maybe you're not. But imagine yourself frail and unable to walk and so weak that it is a strain to get your eyelids open. Sitting in the room with someone who is dying. Ask yourself, but I want to die and go face God the judge as I am today. And if not, then you need to believe from your heart in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Hardest part of the gospel, what he lays out, believe it and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. And you will be saved. Let's pray. Father, the catalyst of us taking up this theme this evening may be the passing of our sister Terry. And yet we believe that these truths have far-reaching implications and may be intensely relevant uh, to all of us, even though we're not in the process of dying that we know of. Use your word. Bring some to faith in Christ by your great grace. And we plead this. In Jesus' name.